Welcome to episode 130 of Destination Linux. This is a podcast of opinions made up of four of the greatest minds ever discussing our passion for Linux. I'm Zeb and with me today are the royal family of Linux. Their royal highnesses, Noah and Michael. And Sir Noah. Course, Princess Ryan. Wh- so, what? <laughs> Noah, what's new with you this week? I uh, I have had I have had uh, Raspberry Pi swap week, so I've been pulling out all of my. I found I had a couple of Raspberry Pi ones still in production, and uh, and so I've been pulling those out and and swapping them out for uh, for uh, uh, Raspberry Pi fours. And also, the Destination Linux laptop got upgraded this week to a IBM ThinkPad T four E four forty. From right. whatever I had before, I think of T420. So now I have a dedicated uh, destination Linux laptop that has a better processor. In. So maybe things will work better. I don't know. And did you move the wallpaper of Michael over to the new laptop? No, the wallpaper is the logo of the no. destination Linux. Well, I would show you that. Cool. Yeah. And then there's a destination Linux sticker on the back. And then I got a Pelican case to put the laptop in that has destination Linux stickers on it. Yeah. I love it. I modified his wallpaper. Yeah, so it's the logo with also a silhouette of my hair. Somebody didn't send Perfect. that to me. <laughs> You'll get it. You'll get it. Oh, good. So, Michael, what, um, how many um, improvements have you made to the show this week? Okay. I've made a lot, actually. I've changed the way a little bit of the overlays of the OBS, so it looks a little bit better, and I've made some changes to the... Okay, it's giving me a hard time because when before we started, they were ta- giving me a hard time about having so many scenes, and no. I was like, yeah, and, and I, I have a bunch of scenes in OBS, and today I added 19 more, so yeah, there's a... Okay, I did a little bit, little bit of work in the OBS. Did the camera sense. stay static, which is odd. You know, it's not because the scenes are not just modifications to the visuals. They're also modifications to the back end to make my editing more smooth and easier. Uh, So that is one. That's actually the entire purpose of those 19 are giving me more control over the back end of what the uh, automation editing timestamp thing that I built uh, is. What is it going to put out? Because it typically only had like there was a limitation for this plugin that only could do five, uh, five comments for hotkeys. Now I have 26 comments. So it works way better. Very cool. So, you know, what's really scary, though, is that you're making all of these improvements that one day you're actually going to be able to produce the show before we've done it. Yes. Yeah, yeah that is the plan. That's what, my, that's what I'm going for. Excellent. And to do that, I'm guessing you'll need what Ryan's going to let us know about. So come on, Ryan. Tell us. Well, what I want you to do is look at it. Look at it. Now respect it. That is, is the that Ryzen the 9 3900X. <laughs> Right it's got there. a nine. It must be an Intel nine. Oh, that is ridiculous. That's nice. I, I didn't know you were switching to Intel. That's awesome. Are you switching your graphics <laughs> over to NVIDIA too? Or? I said Ryzen 9 3900X oh. with 12 cores and 24 threads right here, ready to go into the beast. So I will be having lots of video content coming out soon on this beautiful AM4 processor right there. It's going to be going into the beast. So I'm very, very excited about the that. beast. Is that what you call your oh, yeah. computer? Of course, that's what I call it because it is a beast. Yeah. Actually, when I got to his, his well, last week, I was, at, we were, I was at his house and I was like, how big is this beast computer? He claims it's mm-hmm. actually pretty ridiculous. Like it's one it, of really? the bigger cases. <laughs> like, what do you have for a case? It's the CM Striker. It's a oh, okay. It's a full size tower case. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a massive case, and uh, it also has the Noctua fan in it, which is a massive radiator fan, and you know, thirty two yeah. gigs of DDR four RAM and NVMe but, drives in the works. Did you say thirty four? How do you get thirty four? Thirty two gigs. Oh, okay. of DDR four. Ah. DDR four. Yep. So, Ryan, up did you did I not see um, some pictures of you're actually now going to be moving all this stuff to? Was it like an open case that was just pure glass or something? Yeah, it's a brand no new sides case. or top. That's right. It's it's actually going to be a lot easier to maintain. I'm hoping for cleaning, but it is a open case that basically uh, everything mounts to a base, and you can actually wall mount the computer then onto a wall, and wow. then it has four posts at the bottom and a glass pane, so everything will be accessible very easily, which is very helpful for me because I switch out parts so often I'm constantly upgrading. And so selling. you don't, you don't like, so when I, my workstation in my lab, which I is kind of my, it's kind of home base, right? When with, for that machine, uh, which stay in production for ridiculously long amounts of time, right? I think it's been nine years since I've last upgraded that machine. Wow. Uh, maybe eight. Yeah. It's been a long time. Um, but when I do it, I go all out. It is the absolute best quality pieces of equipment that I can get 
and they go in there and then I don't touch them again, but the, everything gets upgraded at one time. So you don't do that. You kind of have, it's all, you almost have arch for a hardware build. You kind of roll your hardware right. build as you go. I, I do that to keep the budget very in place. Yeah. Cause so every six to nine months I rotate the hardware out to whatever mm -hmm. the latest stuff usually. And I will take the old stuff and resell it, which helps recoup the cost of the new hardware coming. Nice. So it's, it's not the same budget revolving because the newer hardware is generally 50 to a hundred dollars more but it keeps the budget from being, I'm going to spend $3,000 out of pocket at one time to upgrade everything. It's gradually just doing little bits and pieces at a time. And so. so this is, this is what, this is the Ryzen 9? 3900X. 3900X. Okay. Yep. Now there is one coming out in September, which is the basically Zeb's Threadripper inside of an AM4 4 factor. And that comes out uh, in September and is the 3950X that I will be getting because September is my birthday. So the wife has that on my, I want that list. So I'll be upgrading again when that comes out. But this is the fastest one they have now, which is the Ryzen 9 3900X. And I have the X570 MSI Prestige motherboard, which is what I'm waiting on to put that in. Because right mm -hmm. now I'm waiting on that new motherboard because it has all four PCIe 4 slots, which I'm excited. And that will be a straight swap out processor for processor because it'll be on the same motherboard. Um, yeah, well, I'm just going to pull the whole motherboard out of my current machine with the X470 it currently has and the Ryzen CPU. And then I'm going to put the new motherboard and new CPU mm, in. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to sell the motherboard is, CPU as a combo. Really? Hey, yeah. uh, hi. <laughs> Can we talk after the show? <laughs> Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So, and then the other thing I did this week, which was kind of fun, is we you know we talk about accessibility in distros mm -hmm. a lot. And so I decided I was looking through Pop OS, which they did some pretty cool things for AMD this week. And I thought, what's something nice I could do to kind of repay that kindness? And uh, I noticed they didn't have any accessibility documentation. So I spent a day writing up some accessibility documentation for Pop OS. I submitted it. Uh, to them and they already you know giving some feedback and we're changing some things but getting it ready for a merge so accessibility documentation at least as much as i could write uh is up there and going to hopefully be merged into pop os stocks in the future very nice well done nice sorry i'm still hung up i'm i'm I, you've, you're starting to attract me into hardware stuff i i i sorry to keep bringing you back but so what do you what are you upgrading to as a or what do you have now as a motherboard and what are you upgrading to as a motherboard the current motherboard i have now is a fantastic motherboard it's an x470 uh msi pro carbon and gaming pro carbon board which it will allow you to have one pcie4 slot through a bios update on that motherboard so the re the reason i'm upgrading is simply to have all four PCIe 4 slots because I'm going to move to all NVMe M2 drives on an NVMe M2 interface card. Have Just you picked out a board yet? More speed out of it. It's have complete. you picked out a board yet? Yeah, the current board I have is the X, or the board that's coming Monday is the X570 MSI Prestige is what it's called. X570? Yep. Wow, okay, cool. And you yep. think, uh, you think uh, MSI makes a pretty good board? I, I like MSI, you know, they, there's a couple, there's a lot of great manufacturers. And the fact is, is that <coughs> they go in cycles. At times you have MSI being fantastic. At times you have Gigabyte being fantastic. And then they'll release a load of boards that are complete junk. And I'll change and say, don't buy that by, you know, EVGA or one of the other ones out there. But uh, right now, MSI is making fantastic boards and their BIOS updates nice. are very quick. So they've almost gotten as good as Asus then? Yes. Awesome. Asus is makes very good motherboards. Yep. And the only one I hate is ASRock because exactly what you're yes. talking about, they come out with a new board. I had I bought a board from them and then it had this weird bug that if your power went out without you turning your computer off on purpose, it would no longer recognize the power supply. Even though the motherboard would still work, it just would and if you put a new power supply in, it would detect that one and it would work again. But if you had tried to use the same one, it would just completely collapse. And I actually I RMA it and see what happens. They sent me back another board. That did the exact same thing. So I hate ASRock. <laughs> yeah, ASRock goes through phases. They generally are known as more of the budget-friendly motherboard option out there. So Which is why I got it. Of have course. hit or miss in there naturally. Yeah. It's not as bad as Gigabyte. Yep, I have a Gigabyte. It works fine. Shut, yeah, shut uh -huh, your face. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. <laughs> Benjamin writes in and says, Dear Destination Linux, I'm absolutely in love with the work that's being done with Linux Delta. Personally, I think it's a wonderful alternative to DistroWatch. I wanted to suggest, however, that the order in which reviews are displayed is reconsidered. I'm not entirely sure how Linux Delta places reviews now, but it might be cool to see the possibility to filter reviews based on 
how recent they are, how helpful they are, how positive or negative they are. I, for one, find it unpleasant that reviews have zero rated helpfulness and no comments could be placed near the top of the page. If the user could filter reviews based on helpfulness, positivity, negativity, and recent to display first, it would let the user more relevantly find quicker results. Linux Delta is a great website, and I hope it continues to grow and expand. P.S. Destination Linux is my favorite podcast, and thank you to all of the contributions to Destination Linux makes to the Linux community. By the way, I use Ubuntu. Best wishes? No. No, he uses Arch. He uses Arch. Uh, So, yeah, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. It's been a lot of work. Um, So there are essentially two design phases. The first stage was building the back end, and you would not believe the amount of... That's where all of the the hard work uh, from the coding perspective... Well, that's not accurate either. Um, All of the hard work from the, like, programming aspect comes from is on the back end database and all of those things that happen. The second part of that is the front end and and the user interface, and that is absolutely going to be changed. I completely agree with you. When I go to Amazon, if if, if when I went to Amazon, Amazon just listed all of the products there on a page in a list, I would never shop at Amazon. It would be completely useless. You have to be able to search. Uh, for given products, you have to be able to search for something like best desktop distro or desktop distro and then have it show results based on that search, right? Um, also, featured uh, style things, which you're talking about. If you want to see, like when I go to B&H uh, photo video, when I order products, the way I pick out a product is not necessarily, well, certainly not what is in alphabetical order, which is the way that we list our products, but uh, I, I don't even pick them based on what has the best review. I picked on what has the most reviews. And the reason I do that is nobody goes and purchases a product, hates it, goes and leaves a review, and then other people see that negative review and then go buy that thing and then review it, right? The only way to get a lot of reviews is to have people that really, really like it and have a positive review. But no, why would that be any different than just things, than just sorting by positive reviews? Well, if you have two products and one has three and a half stars, but it has 4,700 reviews and another product has five stars, but it has five reviews, which product is better? If you're sorting by best review, the product that has five stars is going to show up. If you're sorting by which has the most reviews, the one that has 4,700 reviews are going to show up. And obviously the one that has 4,700 people purchasing and liking it to the point that it earned 3.5 stars is a better product than the one probably that only got five people to actually purchase it and said, yeah, it's good enough. Mm -hmm. Five. It was one or five. I picked five, you know, those kind of people. Uh, So I completely agree with your feedback. 100%. It is in the works, but Understand that I ha- uh, we had one person that was working on the back end stuff. The front end stuff is just a, it's a totally different ball game, and so we're still trying to work out the details of how that works. And obviously now, you know, when it was in the back end before we announced it, it was like let's try that. Oh look, it dropped all the reviews. Oh well, let's try it again. You know, we can't do that now. So it the the development process is a little slower, but we're definitely working on it. So we want to hear from you, our listeners. Send in your favorite Linux software or tip and trick. We would love to know what tools make your Linux experience amazing. Is there perhaps a specific Linux topic you would like us to try and cover? So send your emails to comments at destinationlinux.org. But please don't get upset if we don't pick your particular email. We get so many good emails that come through, and it is quite difficult sometimes just picking that one that's going to come up with a good topic of discussion. So don't get disheartened. Keep sending those emails in. I, I mean, let's be honest. We also get some bad ones, and that's why they're not making it on the show, too. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to say that, no. Oh, oh, sorry. They're all great emails. We just didn't get time. This episode of Destination Linux is sponsored by our good friends over at DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API. Multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. You also get access to their world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month, or you can use their flexible pricing structure for as low as 0.7 cents per hour, and that's darn near free. So you've got this great price, and then on top of all of that, DigitalOcean also has 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. And those tutorials are very, very simple to follow and very thorough. Get started on DigitalOcean for one month free with a $50 credit. 
by going to do.co slash dl. Again, you can get started on DigitalOcean with that $50 credit by going to do.co slash dl. Debian 10 has been released and it's packing a lot of great features under the hood. Now, App Armor is enabled by default. It's very similar to OpenSUSE, which could help improve security by offering confinement for apps and their access. Updated to Linux kernel 4.19, additional support for more ARM based devices, secure boot support. So most machines can now be, uh, uh, can leave secure boot on in the BIOS. Debian Buster Live, which now provides the option of using Calamares installer, which will offer a simplified and more familiar install over the standard Debian installer. Uh, GNOME, uh, there's a GNOME version of Debian, which now uses Wayland by default. Uh, reproducible builds project, over 91% of open source packages included in Debian 10 will, uh, will build bit for bit identical binary packages. This is an improvement over the verification feature um, which protects users against malicious attempts to tamper with compilers and build networks. Um, I, I guess to start off, the, the thing that, stru that stuck out to me most uh, was the, uh, the choice to, to enable Wayland. Um, seems yeah. a little early to do that by default. Is, like, if we were talking about Arch, I'd be like, oh, that's Arch. That kind of makes sense. If we're even talking about Fedora, it, well, I, I would look at that and go, mm, yeah, Fedora, our, uh, Wayland by default makes sense. Debian? We're going to enable Wayland by default on Debian? So I actually, It still crashes no. This goes back to our conversation that we had talking about, is it time for distros to start moving to Wayland? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Noah, you mentioned Fedora, which ships Wayland by default. Um, you Ubuntu did in a prior version, but then they changed course. And now you have, it looks like Debian doing this by default here. So I think ultimately this will be a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. This is an area we should be pushing. I think one of the big holdbacks with Wayland has always been NVIDIA. And as I understand it, they've created some type of patching to help with that issue in Wayland for NVIDIA or they're in the process of developing it. They're in the process uh, of doing it. They're working yes. on the EGL streams to make it work. And mm -hmm. uh, currently it's waiting for NVIDIA to verify and confirm that it works fine. But yeah. they've already built it, but it's not like deployed yet. I think you're quite right, Ryan, because it's you know, 12 years in the making. Come on, let's have a big push and let's get it past the, the, the finishing post. Let's get Wayland out there and move away from um, the thing that's been holding it together with bits of string and sticky tape right. and nobody I understand from a conversation we had on a on, on Biddle over the weekend that nobody really understands right down to the depths of Xorg well enough to be able to unpick it and, and, and build it a bit better. So it's just this little monster of Lego that you keep adding bits and pieces to to try and keep it holding together. Let's get let's right. get Wayland out there. Let's get it working. Um and let's put it's going to be painful though. This is going to be a painful transition because I, I foresee a lot of NVIDIA users honestly falling into issues, but not just NVIDIA users, people who screen record like we do, mm -hmm. you know, streaming. I, I just, it's, there's going to be a lot of bugs happening. Uh, I really feel but like this is, I really feel like this is a, a fundamental breakdown that we, and this is not the first time we've suffered this, a fundamental breakdown of the way that we as Linux users approach our users. Like, you would, I don't, imagine if Microsoft said, yeah, in the latest version of Windows 10, uh, we're switching some components, and um, so some stuff may crash a lot, but uh, we're going to go ahead and ship that in Windows 10, because uh, we're at a point now where if we don't switch over to this new technology, then uh, we're essentially, it's going to be more work for it. Like, I, I, ju I just don't see that argument standing up, like, and, I, and I understand, again, I get it with Arch, I get it with Fedora, I, I just... When it comes to, like, f the, the foundations, like Debian, I, I'll, t I'll go on the record, I don't see CentOS doing that, right? Like, go, getting to a point, like, I, I, I suppose the other way around that, uh, the other way to look at that, though, is CentOS is going to go to Wayland for their, for their desktop stuff. Their argument for that would be, well, we're not going to use, in servers, you're not going to have a graphic environment anyway, and that would also be true of Debian. So I, I, I guess I just talked myself over to the other side, I guess, a little bit. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it is an interesting, I, I, I get where you were going with your initial argument because part of me agrees, right? We're just starting to pick up steam. We don't want to throw four months of, you know, sideballs to everybody who's trying to port to Linux and having nothing but crashing or not being able to get basic things like OBS to work and, and such. So 
Um, but I do think that you will always have the option, hopefully, to transition back to X. Um, I, I like what the other distros like Fedora have tried. And I believe, Zeb, you were the one who did this recently where you tried to use Wayland in Fedora, which it defaults to, and it mm -hmm. automatically detected you had NVIDIA and moved you back to X. Correct. Right? So this is a great workaround option so that you don't have a bunch of people breaking while we wait for NVIDIA to catch up or finish their stuff and also allows Linux to move forward because until everyone starts using it, nobody's going to really know all the things that are broken. But to your point, Noah, there are things we know are broken that should be fixed already. Like, for instance, you know, screen recording like OBS doesn't work. OBS is a major tool that a lot of people rely on in, in Linux. So um, sure, it's a specific group of people rely on it, like streamers and podcasters and those type of things, but still a lot of people rely on it. Well, also, and, it's, it's very heavily used for just capturing and doing tutorials. So if you want to explain mm -hmm. someone how to use something, you can like it's, it limits the options you have to do that. So like the there is screen capturing in Wayland. It's just not the ones that are the most powerful and most useful. I think there's only one right now and it's called Green Recorder and it does technically function, but it's just a capturing and then that's it. So you have to do everything else in like post, whereas OBS allows you to record and do a bunch of other stuff directly onto the recording as you do it. So that is a, a fundamentally important thing for a lot of people. Uh, you know, even if you're just creating content, like creating a podcast, like without OBS, there'd be so much more work to do. So yeah. I think that OBS is, is definitely a necessity. And you could argue that it's kind of an OBS that needs to be developing that part. But at the same time, I don't think that we should be, you know, trying to force the developers and companies to, you know, do it our whim of switching to this particular th situation. Like, because if we, if we imp implement Wayland before it's ready and people just start switching and the developers are like having issues of like whether it doesn't work or not, they're not going to care because we don't have the market share enough to make them care. And if we start forcing problems, all they're going all it's going to do is just make them say, "See, told you that Linux thing's not ready. We're just going to go away." Yes. Mm -hmm. That exactly what you just said. Mm, that's interesting. I, I I definitely see both your points on that. And you know, I I did look at this though looking at it from a different perspective cuz the Wayland thing you know, we're just going to have to see how it all lands out there. And Ubuntu being having the biggest share, as far as I know, isn't doing that push yet. So maybe um, they're waiting for more things to stabilize before they officially push uh, Wayland out, which will keep certain services like OBS and stuff working. But what I thought was interesting about this is it almost looked like there's a lot of stuff here that I typically don't see from a Debian. And maybe it's just me uh, not being in Linux long enough, but from a Debian release that are more user desktop oriented. Um, yeah, like calamaris and stuff? Yeah, like the yeah. calamaris portion of it, the, you know, making sure secure boot doesn't need to be turned off uh, in the BIOS for it to boot, which is a big deal because if you're, somebody's coming over to the Linux for the first time and doesn't know that sometimes secure boot will uh, keep these systems from booting, they won't know to turn that off and they'll just go and install Ubuntu instead and it will work. Um, but you know, that allows you now adding those type of features in there. Um, it just seems like they are looking, maybe they're looking a little more back to the desktop users, which would be interesting because there's no reason why they shouldn't be a dominant desktop force. I mean, I know a lot of people use it as a base and a lot of people use it as servers and some groups of people use it as a desktop, but the vast majority probably are on Ubuntu instead. And it, it would be interesting to see if they actually do a push to make Debian more user friendly. Yeah, and mm -hmm. also adding app armor by default is interesting because it's not necessarily useful to like the desktop thing you're talking about, but it does make it sort of useful to the desktop because app armor is a, a dependency for snaps, and it makes it easier to get snaps on Debian by having it on by default. So mm -hmm. like that is a pretty interesting approach. That it does seem like Debian is doing a lot more stuff to make it easier, and I think that it's good overall. I, I don't think that they're really focused on trying to be a desktop thing, but I think it is. They're no. they're more lenient, like they're more open to the idea of people using it as a desktop these days. Mm -hmm. Linux kernel five point two has been released, and it is packing in some really nice goodies in there. So some highlights include improved AMD support, including the Vega twenty experimental work and AMD Ryzen laptop compatibility improvements. Now, this one was really important because we get a lot of people who are now looking for Ryzen laptops specifically. 
There are certain versions of the Ryzen laptops like Huawei makes and things that have some random bugs and issues uh, that pop up. Nothing, you know, earth shattering bad, but, um, you know, stuff that's annoying, little uh, freezes here and there and stuff like that. So it looks like they are working to create a lot more um, compatibility improvement within the kernel, which is where AMD releases their improvements here in 5.2. Logitech devices also receiving some additional compatibility in there, along with more Wi-Fi card support. So now if you're out there getting some random Wi-Fi cards that used to not work uh, and you'd have to go hunt down or find your own driver for, there are more drivers now going to be built into the kernel itself. And a whole mega list of new single board computers that they are adding support in for kernel 5.2. Um, along with these bug fixes, you've got GeForce GTX 1650 gets Novo support. Intel Comet Lake support is in there. Prep for the next-gen AMD Epic CPUs, which is their server line. Uh, hibernation support re-enabled on Intel Bay Trail and Cherry Trail. UTF-0 driver and Thunderbolt support. And Noah will love this for older Apple hardware because we know how much he loves using that stuff. So... <laughs> Lots of you know, here's the thing. I mean, you joke, but the honest to gosh truth is uh, nothing actually makes me happier than when we can steal people from the Mac ecosystem and absolutely. bring them over to Linux. And to do that, we got to have, you know, driver support for the webcam be nice. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So this to me is just more reason why being on a rolling distro for me is so important because look how much in this update of hardware is getting enabled in this patch and how much work is going into it. So you know, I'm going to have this now on Arch and other people are going to have to wait, you know, depending on when the next iteration of their current distro is. So there's so much now that we're seeing from the hardware vendors that they're throwing all their support into the kernel. And it's just awesome to see, number one. And um, we're getting it from all brands, right? You're getting things from little uh, accessories like the Logitech mice and webcams and things all the way through to CPUs and GPUs, so it's very cool stuff. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I mean, they're they're doing a lot of stuff, and I agree with the whole, you know, rolling kind of makes sense when you want to have you have the latest and greatest hardware, uh, and that's why I typically don't have the latest and greatest hardware. It's not because that it's too expensive and not cheap. It's because of the support. Okay, mm -hmm. let's all pretend that that's true. Yeah. So we're all nodding in agreement. Yeah. That's why it is. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but it is awesome that they're that they they're, they're doing all this stuff and and like the experimental for the Vega twenty is is awesome. But they're going to be so they've already announced that the five point three is going to have support for the latest hardware, which should come out before all the other distros. Uh, like like the the pro the problem with their you know some of these distros you know they might take six to a year, six months to a year to to do a release. But in some ways, you could say that's kind of good in the sense that the 5.3 will be out by that time. But it just happened time, to land at that yeah. circumstantially. Yeah, that yeah. was pure luck. Even but if you they made don't a joke about having older hardware, but that's not necessarily true. You're, you're slowly upgrading your rig, and you have a Vega 64 now, which is a beast of a video card. It's a fantastic right. I mean, it's, video card in there, and you're going to benefit from 5.2 here. And AMD has this bad habit. They have a bad habit of releasing incredible hardware and then their software slowly ramps it up to where it should be, right? right? It, it, and then, so it's kind of neat and disappointing as a user because it's neat from the aspect that four months later, your card is getting faster than it ever was, but you're also sitting there going, well, why couldn't you have just done this when you released it? Um, mm -hmm. So it, it is interesting um, being on a rolling release with AMD equipment because every iterative upgrade they do here, like in this, for your case, you're going to, on yours, is going to be under the Vega 20 line, going to get speed boosts from your GPU uh, with any of the work that they're implementing here. So, yeah. There you so, it's, 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 it's awesome, and they're doing a lot of cool stuff, and a lot of times, we're like, you know, the latest release of the kernel is not that in interesting to a lot of people, but this one has a lot of things that are valuable for the hardware and variety of things like the Logitech stuff and all that. So, this one actually is a really awesome, even just for d d desktop users and stuff like that. So let's move on to some other hardware news. And the Raspberry Pi 4 has yet another flaw. Why, oh, why did I buy it on day one? That's the question that you've exactly. got to ask yourself sometimes when you buy this uh, equipment as soon as it comes out. So they had a massive win with the specifications that was the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, but issues keep rolling in. 
whilst they're going to be fixing the heat issue with a firm up, firmware upgrade, um, there's another issue that won't be fixed by software. And it turns out that certain USB-C charging cables are not working with the Pi 4. And the fix will only be available in future iterations of the hardware. Now, uh, the article goes on to talk about the problem is that the Pi 4 is not supporting electronically marked cables such as Apple's USB-C cable or Google's Pixel 3 cables. And it almost makes it sound like the fault is with the cable. It's 100% not. When they built the Raspberry Pi, the adapter that they made with the board didn't follow the standard that was out there. Correct. Yep. So you come along and it's almost like saying Michael's 54321 counts, Pi did 531. <laughs> and so when it gets to a cable that's got four in it, the countdown goes, what, for A, four? Four doesn't exist. We're supposed to be going 531. So it's the same with the cable. These cables are perfectly well built and they're built to standard. It's the Raspberry Pi 4 that its USB charging port is not. So here's a question. Tech enthusiasts went out, bought this cable, bought this Raspberry Pi 4. There's something intrinsically wrong with it. Can I get a refund? Can I ask for the new one when it comes out? Where do we stand on stuff like that? What do you guys think? Usually not, because in, in this case, if you bought like you did, I, I've got the Raspberry Pi 4 here. I can't boot it up. I had a Samsung USB-C cable um, that I had used for a phone, and I plugged it in. And this talks about the phone cable specifically not working, and it wouldn't power up. And that's how you know your cable doesn't work. If you get the nice lights showing that your Raspberry Pi is lighting is booting, but you get nothing on your screen, that is likely your USB-C issue there uh, popping in. So I did experience this issue directly. Um, generally, they're not going to give you a refund, especially on such a low-cost item. I guess it depends on the vendor that you purchase it from. Obviously, mm -hmm. if you got it from like an Amazon or something, you probably send it back pretty easily. You know, it's not a deal breaker. It's a little bit shocking that they seem to have, they weren't really, it, this wasn't a rush out, right? They weren't trying to compete with somebody that I could see or they just seemed to release an item that had a lot of great spec improvements and so much promise, but mm -hmm. they had a lot of issues that I think they should have caught before yes. they released it. Yeah. Um, obviously, yeah. future iterations are going to be better and with Pies... No, like they won't. No, they won't. Every, every single iteration of the Pi... I mean, I, I apologize for interrupting, but every no, single iteration of the Pi has made a claim and then they fall short. I don't, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that the, the future iterations are going to be better. And you know what? Here's the thing. I accept the Pi for what it is, but, it, it, but it, it's a low-cost, low-powered computer device that's meant for tinkering. It's not, it's not a production device. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's going to get better in future iterations, as in they're, they, they say, at least, they're going to fix the USB-C compatibility in the next ones, but we're stuck with these that don't. At the same time, you know, you go buy their $11 charger um, that they, that, that's the official Raspberry Pi charger, and you're all set and ready to go. Yeah. Uh, the heating issue to me was more concerning, and the fact that they at least got that fixed with the firmware is good, because if it had constantly had that heat issue, I would not be keeping the board around because to me, that's just not, that's not good. So not good. Yeah. Uh, but I mean this, so this firmware update, is it going to throttle the device to stop the heat from generating? You know, it's, it's interesting because I'm trying to recall the articles I read on it this week. Mm -hmm. It was, there, there was some faulty connection ports as I understand it, that they basically not faulty connection ports, the voltage that they were sending to the, the connection ports was too much. They were sending too much voltage to them that wasn't necessary. So it has nothing to do with throttling the device itself. Mm -hmm. They were basically right. through their software sending incorrect voltage parameters to gotcha. the ports, causing them to heat up. So that firmware fix fixes that, and you're not going to have throttling as a result. But because this device gets hot so quickly, just in general, yeah, you would, if you did not do that firmware, certainly be dealing with hitting temperature thresholds that's going to throttle your device, mm -hmm. uh, most likely, depending on what they set those thresholds to. Uh, well, it does it, it, does it within about five minutes of watching a YouTube HD video. Um, in the top right-hand corner of your screen, you'll get a little red thermometer come up and it flashes, and then the video starts stuttering. Um, and the way I got around it was I got a desk fan 
and blew it onto the Raspberry Pi for a bit. The heat went out and the video started working again. So it's definitely a heat mm -hmm. throttling issue. But you have it, you have it, you don't have the firmware yet because I don't think it's out. But once no, you do that no, no, firmware, no. yeah, your port should stop overheating. That should stop yeah. hitting the threshold and you should stop throttling as much. At least that would be my hope. I haven't tested it yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe next time we could find the time to test that before we ship them out, you know, play a 4K video for a little bit, see how it I, works. I, I, Just a thought. <laughs> yeah. Ryan said something about he doesn't think that they were rushed out, but I, 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 I could have sworn I read an article that, to say, that said, don't expect the Pi anytime soon in 2019. And then bingo, next week I get an email oh, saying the Raspberry Pi 4 is ready. So was here's, here's the thing though. Was, is there any, have you ever met a single human being? That's or have you heard any podcasters? Have you seen any articles that basically said like we were waiting for the next pie? We want the next. Like nobody cares. Everybody was happy with the pie three yeah. for what it was. Every before the pie three, everybody's happy with the pie two, but the pie one. Nobody, there's never no, nobody's ever pressured the Raspberry Pi Foundation mm. to get a pie out faster. It's just, Correct. I mean, sure, we all get excited, and yes, people are going to might click baity articles, and haters are going to hate. That's the nature of the internet. But there was really no pressure to get those things out. Not they just chose point. to rush it, and and you know, and it's people like me looked at it and got disappointed. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a good point. I mean, I've never thought about it, but but I agree. Like I. I'm always interested when they get the new Pi out, when they get the new different Pi models, like the, the Zero, Zero W, or all things that they've done. I'm always interested in what they do, but I never am like, when are you making the next one? It's more like, it's going to come at some point, and you know, that's going to be awesome. But and that's what I was whatever. trying to say. Like, there was no, there didn't seem to be any outside pressure for them to release this thing in a hurry, and that yet, when it seems like a device that's been released in a hurry, that's this is what you expect from a device that's, oh my gosh, this new competitor came in and we're losing sales, so let's throw this thing out there. And maybe behind the scenes, that was what's happening. I was aware of it, that they needed something to boost sales in there and through four gigs. Cause I know NVIDIA has come into the picture with their uh, single board alternative and things that has- yeah, but that thing's so expensive, it's not, it's not really in the same league. Yeah, but I mean, com competition's competition. So we'll see how it all works out. At least they're working on fixing some of these problems and maybe they'll learn a lesson from this if there's enough backlash or sales issues. Unfortunately, I think most of these sold out the moment they listed them. So yeah, <laughs> uh, they're probably not going to feel the pain on this one until they release something else. And instead of buying it right away, people wait. So AMD is bringing the fire sauce for hardware um, but you know, they dropped a little bit on the drivers recently. We uh, could skip this article. We could, but I think that <laughs> team Greed would be offended by us doing so specifically. Yeah, so. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, uh, but first of all, we're all fans of, of AMD and the work that they've done, including the NVIDIA people. Cause even if the NVIDIA users are still have to thank the AMD uh, team, uh, company because they're making competition and therefore making NVIDIA care about Linux where they, used to didn't care at all and you'd, you'd be lucky if you got an update once a year uh now they're doing it constantly so they're actually because of all this effort that amd is doing like the eight eight point five times more open source code in the kernel than nvidia is really getting nvidia to be worried and making sure that they're trying to support linux as as much as possible so we all love amd because they're helping you know the ecosystem so much uh, but there have been some issues with like the early adopter stuff with the hardware from AMD's like latest CPU and GPU lineup, and this hardware has been like just completely busting through benchmark records and even exceeding the metrics for the CPU and GPU that they set during their their own demo. But but it appears they haven't spent that much time for the new hardware in Linux because uh, Pharonix recently wrote an article when they when they on on launch day. They tested out the new Ryzen CPUs and also with the latest X570 motherboards, and they couldn't get the the CPU to boot on certain versions of Linux. Now they could get it to boot on Ubuntu 17 or 17 Ubuntu 18.04 LTS, and yeah. they could get it on older distributions, but like the brand new distributions had new versions of different uh, packages, was not booting for some reason. And they found out that the problem seemed to be caused by the RD RAND package that's uh, causing system D to crash, uh, which also then made the system the system not boot uh, on anything that is beyond you know 1804. Like even 1904 wouldn't work because it had different versions of system D, different versions of the kernel, and this and there was this weird issue. But AMD has given an official response to the matter, 
and it states, AMD has identified the root cause and implemented a BIOS fix for an issue impacting the ability to run certain Linux distributions and Destiny 2 on Ryzen 3000 processors. We have distributed an updated BIOS to our motherboard partners, and we expect consumers to have access to the new BIOS over the coming days. Which is, I have, I, you know, I don't know if people have experienced this, have got the update yet, but depending on which manufacturer you have for the motherboard, it might take a while, it might be quick. You know, some of them take forever, some of them are really quick. So uh, this is actually pretty great, and it's, and it's kind of interesting, because I saw an article talking about this, saying that they're more likely to get the upgrade fixed on the BIOS because it's not just a Linux issue. It also affects a particular game that might make them care about it because it's a Windows related issue. And I think that's kind of sad, but at the same time, you know, at least, you know, AMD was noticing like, hey, that you also make sure you want to fix this too, just in case you you don't care about Linux. So I think that's kind of funny. Well, we know thing. AMD cares about Linux, right? No, no, no right. I'm saying they AMD might... is telling the manufacturers just in case yeah. you don't care. We're, we care, and we're going to tell you an extra God. thing to make you care more. Yeah, I, I think this whole thing was interesting. It was slightly disappointing. I, I reached out to AMD on their forums. I reached out to uh, Lisa Sue in Twitter just to hopefully create some attention to the issue. The disappointing part is that Linux or AMD spent months ahead of time rolling code into the kernel to prepare for this release. And it seems to me what has happened is they're only sitting there testing Ubuntu 18.04 and thought everything was fine, right? The LTS version right. and did not test any other distros. That that was the that's the only conclusion and I don't know specifically, this is just my guess of what could have happened because this is not a situation where some people were replying to me saying, "Oh, well, you know, of course AMD's not going to spend as much time on Linux because they're going to focus on the bigger market Windows and all that." Okay, I agree, any company would do so, but AMD did spend a lot of time focusing on getting this ready for Linux. It's just, this is a weird problem that popped up specifically for Linux that didn't exist in the one LTS version of Linux out there, Ubuntu right. 18.04. I also want to mention, when I mentioned earlier that I wanted to do something you know, for Pop! OS, what they did, during this debacle, Pop! OS rolled a patch to their distro to make this work in later versions for Pop! OS, which tells me that they were sitting there because now, and we'll get to this later, they're they're putting some AMD hardware out there. And so they, they were really a true patron of the community, in my opinion, going out there, finding an issue and putting a fix in place so quickly for yeah. this. And the only distro that I know of that actually did so, actually did some work to try to solve this for customers to try to use this. And that was going to be my backup plan if I had received the motherboard and processor on time, which I guess it's good, I, it got delayed shipping from AMD um, because you know I won't get my motherboard till Monday and by then hopefully the patch is out because they said it'll take three to four days. MSI is usually really quick on that, uh, but Pop! OS would have been my default. I, I could have fallen back to installing Pop! OS and still had the system working thanks to the work that they did there. So, I mean, all in all, awesome. I, it's not a great, situation that AMD has put themselves in, in with the drivers, I also feel like nobody's helping them at all. I, I just don't feel like any distros are reaching out and maybe they're not reaching out. I don't know who's to blame here. Maybe it's both of them, but it just doesn't seem like anybody's out there, Pop! OS being the, the uh, one exception here, trying to help AMD fix this stuff. And they're the ones, the, them and Intel are the ones contributing so much to open source and everybody's focusing on nvidia and it, it's it's frustrating to me yeah i i agree with that it's it's definitely i mean it's fantastic that you know system 76 and pop os decided to address it that's awesome um then also they did it within like a day or two so that's yep. really impressive uh but and, it, and it's not even that like the, the reports are saying that it's not even that huge of a problem they just need to make sure that the versions are in the, the different uh packages are available and you so that it could have been found and addressed much quicker in all of these different distributions uh and i and I, I agree i think that amd is just supporting just the like the the lts distros even if it's just ubuntu because there are supports uh, reports that are other things that are working that really older versions were working even if it wasn't like based on Ubuntu, um, but it yeah, is, if they used an earlier version of System D or right. didn't use System D at all, it would work fine. Yeah, 
So it was, it was just kind of weird that there was a that, that situation where they, it seems like they were just focusing on the LTS of Ubuntu. And that's unfortunate because uh, it's also kind of odd because they, they because they're focused on releasing everything in the kernel, and because they're focused on releasing uh, you know stuff in the Mesa drivers and that kind of thing, it makes more sense than to focus on all of the latest releases as well for at least for Ubuntu because they if they would have tested 1904 they would have noticed that the problem was there too, yeah. Uh, and, and whether they test on Arch or Fedora or Solus or something else that or OpenSUSE that rolls really quickly. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily have to do it because they still would have found the problem if they did 1904. So it's just kind of surprising that they would focus, you know, use the kernel as where they ship everything, knowing that the kernel is not up to date on the LTS version, but then only test the LTS version. So I mean, it just seems like there's like a mismatch here where the distros are not trying to help the AMD team because the AMD team is working on with the kernel and they assume that that's all that needs to be done. And then the AMD people are working with a kernel but also only testing on the LTS stuff which creates this weird mismatch of versioning approach that they're that everybody's having so I think that AMD if AMD were just to have like you know a PPA or a repo of some kind that's separated in a similar way that Nvidia does even if they were doing a kernel stuff they could like hey you have this kernel so here's this feature to make this work or I don't or like at least the Mesa drivers anyway. Like having some kind of set up, set up with the Mesa drivers, that would be amazing if they did that. But uh, it is kind of weird. But overall, they as soon as they it was found, you know they they announced the, they figured out the problem. They announced the fix super quick. So that I mean that's a good thing itself. So at least uh, if, even though AMD didn't find it themselves and they didn't find it before launch, once it was informed, they were informed of it. They did fix it pretty quickly. Well, at least yeah. until whatever the. Well, there's thing. a lot of heroes out there in the community. Pharonix, obviously, um, you know Jason Evangelo, who we had on the show, did a lot of. He got some of the equipment ahead of time. Did a lot of reporting on some of the issues uh, that were occurring and getting regular updates out to the community on it. With that and the AMD's latest GPU, which also has uh, its support uh, only landing in the 5.2 kernel we talked about earlier. And forward, so rolling distro should be golden there. But anybody else may have to wait, like you said, Michael. They don't put they put stuff in the kernel. They don't they don't have a PPA out there, and I think that is an option that they need to um, you know try to fix uh, in the future. So it's interesting. It's an interesting world. I think we're backing the right horse here because AMD is the one that's backing open source the most, yeah. and Intel, of course. But at the same time, there needs to be some better collaboration between the hardware and the software here. Uh, for everybody to you know be able to run this stuff on day one because we have a lot more hardware enthusiasts coming into Linux. Yeah, I agree, and, and it is definitely worth saying. Like, while this is a mistake, it's not a huge mistake, and they're already addressing it. And at the same time, it, we know that AMD cares because they're actually doing all this stuff in the open and everything. So even yeah. then, even with this as a negative problem, I think that the overall the work that they're doing, we should definitely you know thank AMD for all the stuff that they're doing, and also. You know, if you were using a distro that doesn't, you know, pay attention to the AMD, maybe send them a message and let them know that you wanted you wanted to switch to AMD, but you can't or whatever. Uh, yeah, you know, because that AMD, really would help. Yeah, because I think that AMD is definitely going it, like we should be because they are helping the ecosystem. I think the ecosystem should help them too. Yep. So the AMD news keeps rolling in, and it and it begs the question: um, Is twenty nineteen going to be? The year of the Linux AM desktop. <laughs> nice. Certainly, uh, System76 thinks it might be. Um, because as we all know, that they are an awesome pillar of the Linux community, um, and they have just announced some cool AMD news. So the beautiful Thelio systems that now come with Ryzen third-generation CPU options. And I think Ryan wrote this because he's put, finally. Yeah. So the Thelio desktops that are designed and manufactured in Colorado using U.S. sourced wood and aluminium, sorry, aluminum, finished, etched, <laughs> and built by artisans in the Denver, Colorado factory. It's great to see System76 expanding their hardware options for these gorgeous des desktops, and likely one of the reasons why they were able to 
patch Pop! OS so quickly with the third gen AMD CPUs? Because if they've got them on board, if they've got them in a factory, their um, developers can work on it very, very quickly. Lots of the other distros tend to pay little attention to what AMD are, are doing. And it's good to see that System76 picked up on this um, so quickly. And, and for me as well, I think it will be great for a company like System76 to get some AMD stuff out there so that we can compete with the Intel and the NVIDIA stuff. Because as we're going to find out in the next article, the, the other companies involved have no option but to respond. Yep. So this is great news from System76. Absolutely. I, I just, you know, they've, they've kind of come out and I've really, I've always respected System76, but recently it just seems like they are really doing some neat things in the community. They're, if you follow them on social media at all, they're constantly holding Linux events and celebrations and getting the community together to work on things. So they, they just seem to really be this force behind the Linux desktop where I see so many other distros, frankly, my opinion is they're leaving. They're, they're not leaving. They're ignoring the desktop. They care more about the cloud. That's where their focus is. They kind of got popular through the desktop and now they just want to focus on the cloud. Whereas system 76 really is seeming to pick up that slack where a lot of distros are leaving behind to say, Hey, we'll come up here and, you know, make lots of um, great hardware for users of the Linux desktop space. And Pop! OS has gotten better and better and better every iteration. And it is much more than... I've seen this comment to this day of people saying, well, Pop! OS is just a theme over top of Ubuntu. And it's the biggest amount of nonsense out there. And in fact, there's so much nonsense about that. They literally have a page called Difference Between Pop and Ubuntu, where they go through all of the differences that they have in there from the encryptions by default to some of the settings and hardware enablements and things that they put into Pop! OS that make it completely, not completely different, but make it definitely something more than just the theming distro out there. And mm -hmm. the fact that they went and picked up and fixed some of these issues so quick just kind of shows whether they did for AMD, NVIDIA, Intel, it doesn't matter. It just shows you that they're in, they're engaged, they're involved yeah. with the community and their users. And I am just, I really want to get my hands on a, a Thelio now uh, that they have a Ryzen option out there for me. So who knows, maybe I'll have two beasts sitting here soon. <laughs> And also, it is worth saying that you said that maybe they're not just doing AMD; they're also doing Intel and Nvidia. They are doing Intel and Nvidia, and they also have their own separate uh, ISOs for each of the, whether it's AMD or Nvidia, so you can actually choose which one you by default. And they get that way they can separate the amount of work that they do. Uh, you know, they, they they can update the AMD one because they're not going to be having one ISO that also affects in, Nvidia users. They don't have to worry about whether there's any conflict there. So it's a nice, it's an interesting approach that they're doing that as well. And uh, I agree that the System76, it's actually kind of funny because when they first came out, you know, like 10 years ago or so, there was this uh, this claim that they were just a, you know, they're just a company that takes the ODM hardware and then repurposes it and all that stuff. But they've, they've and for the entire time, they've done also extra stuff like driver building. They've been making sure that stuff that supported the, the hardware was like uh, accessible, whatever, whatever distro that they, like they shipped with Ubuntu. But you know, previously. And then people would say, well, it's just Ubuntu on this hardware. It's like, but they also did a bunch of kernel stuff. They also did a bunch of other stuff. And the same well, thing applies to... Not only to that, the support to the end user, right? Like, yeah. even even aside from all of the hardware modifications that they made, just the fact that there is a place that a user can say, I want to purchase a laptop, and I want some people that, that really care about Linux. And this mm -hmm. is not a knock on Dell, right? Because Barton George is a great guy. And, and he has a, he has a huge passion for bringing Linux and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you call Dell that you call the Dell support line. You're like, yeah, hey, I have a problem with my Ubuntu laptop, right? The chances of them taking that problem as seriously as 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 their Windows side, or I, I would guess, I don't know, I've actually never had a problem with the Dell laptop, are fairly slim. But Michael, you and I have both been to System76. Mm -hmm. Those guys eat, live, and breathe Linux, yes, right? Very like much. they really, really, really care. So yeah. it just it's one of those things where I look at it, I'm like, man, if you want to talk about, if you want to have a great experience, that's the place you go. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. There's actually the, the, the way they, they care so much, they do even like spe like ridiculous detail of their of Thaleo, for example, like their even their case 
is expressing how much they care without really being that blatant about it. They're they're not really promoting it. They maybe they should, but they're not really promoting it that much. But like they even have like the solar system on the back of the a case for the Thaleo is in the location as uh, you know the the t- the the all the planets and everything are aligned at this at the a moment of the epoch time for Unix time. So like they have a lot of even tiny little details like that is how much they put effort in. And like when I when you said you were going to System 76 because their customer service cares, I actually mm-hmm. uh, was on a forum at one point and someone was asking like I want to find a I want to get a Linux computer, but I want to get someone like have it with a company that actually like will pay attention and help me if I have support or whatever. So I sent a message to uh, that person saying you should contact System 76 and I also said, you know, contact Emma because that might you know make it even easier and uh they sent me the message like the next day thanking me so much for suggesting say 76 because it was such a great experience for them because anytime they had any question they would just immediately go talk to you know system 76 customer service and like have it solved immediately so like it was like that is a also a good example of they they care not only in just the hardware and making everything you know work as well as they can. They also do care about the hard the, the product that they sell and the making sure that the the service that they sell is equally as high as that. So, uh, yeah, I think System seventy six is one of those companies that you know they they've been around a long time and they've proven in many cases that they care. Like yeah. Dell has proven that they have now cared somewhat, but System seventy six is all in. Well, Lenovo is now releasing some lines, as I understand, as well with you know Linux support and things. But nobody has gone all in like System76, and I'll be hard pressed that my next laptop probably won't be that one. Although I'm going to have to somehow budget all of this new stuff, plus the new Pine Book, plus a System76 <laughs> laptop, plus it. Well, we'll figure it plus out. Plus your ten thousand right. dollar new desktop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sure. You could actually fund it, or if you just sold off all your Apple phones. <laughs> How dare you? I would never sell off such a perfect device. <laughs> I can't wait to read the comments wow. on that. Yeah, on that one, sure. Yeah. Wow. And we give Michael a hard time. <laughs> right? We've been talking on the show uh, for a long time about how competition is good for the consumer. And it turns out that's great because... NVIDIA is back on top. NVIDIA has now responded to the aggressive AMD lineup and some of the price drops, the revised GPU offerings. And so now NVIDIA is coming out to wipe AMD off the planet with their GeForce RTX 2060. The super GPU that starts at 299 has 50 billion times more of the processing. No, I'm just kidding. It starts (laughs) at 299 and a 15% speed increase over the original 2060. A revised uh, RTX 2070 starting at 499, which is uh, 18 or excuse me, 16% faster faster and updated from the 2080 starting at 699. Uh, so the 2060 and the 2070 will be available in July. Well, the 2080 will not release until, well, they'll both be available in July. One is on the 9th and the other will be on the 23rd. Uh, NVIDIA is clearly trying to take back their market because they they looked over, they realized that there's some competition that AMD has provided. So now they've turned around and and, and taken back the market and they're obviously, what are you talking Ryan about? is going back to the green side. <laughs> wow. Isn't that, isn't that, that's what I heard, right? right you so have I, completely I ruined this that. article. <laughs> it, was, it was good because this, this article was obviously written um, by uh, an, an AMD fanboy. I'm not quite sure who that might be. Right. But the not thing me. that I find so frustrating about this, and it's actually a positive for AMD, people went out and bought the Geoforce RTX 2060. And a couple of months later, all of a sudden, they can get a 15% boost out of it. What happened to my product? Did you sell me an inferior product? Did you mm-hmm. build this latency into this product so that, and I think Ryan, you might have mentioned it before, where NVIDIA will bring out this fantastic card, but it's all held back. It's all held throttled, throttled back. I bet maybe like some of the Intel processors that are held back until the competition starts c- catching up, and then they'll increase the voltage into the application, or they'll they'll just tweak something, and all of a sudden that product is now 15% better. Great that they are reacting and having to react because they want their market share back and they want to be number one again. But, uh, you know, it, it does make you think, well, if this was there in the first place, why didn't it come out with that right. speed increase in the first place so that they wouldn't have to make a 2060 super 
GP. Well, the Super is just an overclocked version of the 2060 in essence. Mm. So, you know, they there's all kinds of different claims out there. You say, well, it's overclocked or they're looking for a, you know, more precision GPU out there that allows them to go to 15%. But I think the big thing here is that they brought they dropped their prices tremendously. And mm. if you remember, the GPU market was being owned entirely by one company, and frankly, they deserve to own it. Right. They had the best option out there, period. And nothing yes. was even close to it. So until the RX line came out from AMD, like the Ryzen line came from the CPU, nobody was competing with them. You either had Intel GPU built in and you weren't going to do a lot of gaming or you had NVIDIA because anything that was running AMD was sloppy at best. Yep. And so now NVIDIA for the first time, again, AMD is competing against two companies is forced to react and forced to react in the way NVIDIA hates to react the most, which is dropping prices. And that's because AMD is killing it in the price per performance. So NVIDIA users can go out there and say, and by the way, as a hardware enthusiast, I'm always going to use what I think is the best out there. The reason I back the AMD horse is because they back the open source horse. And I think other, everyone should be looking towards that. But besides that, NVIDIA has the fastest GPU. I'm not going to argue that, but the RX has come out with price per performance and there's nothing you're doing with these cards right now that in mass, I'm talking heavy gamers, all of that, that the RX 590s and the Radeon 7s and things can't do. It's not like you're over there running some special program that the AMD GPUs can't run anymore. So I think people are catching on that all this RTX nonsense and things that NVIDIA has been selling is really just... It, it's iterative upgrades at best, and people are overpaying for GPUs at this point. Meaning, I tell people, you know, I love the Radeon 7, don't buy one. It is complete overkill. There is nothing. Uh, Michael saw it. We put one of the games, what was the game? Devil May Cry Devil 5. May Cry, yeah. just came out. We put it on the highest settings. The fans on the Radeon 7 wouldn't even spin up, except for one part. They spun up and then they wow. spun back down. You can't even mm -hmm. get it to use the power and it was running at like 134 frames per second. So that's yeah. awesome. And that's also just, through Proton. So it was also doing emulation layer stuff. So man, yeah. it's insane. So nobody just imagine how much more of that NVIDIA GPU must be then. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody wow. needs this type of power is what I'm saying. And this is so good for consumers because finally, whether you're, you want an NVIDIA or you find a nice NVIDIA, a GPU out there for a good price, you're not going to get it for a hundred to $150 less than what you were paying for it. And then AMD reacted again and dropped the prices on their RX line by another $50. So the only people who are winning here is us. Is the That's consumer, the absolutely. All right, so I hesitated whether to bring this topic up, but I, I found it kind of interesting and I wanted to get everyone's take on it. So the internet didn't really do a massive The storm. devil. But the internet <laughs> did start raging over some decisions. And, and when I say the internet, I mean, small pockets of people were raging again at Canonical. And this time it was because they are, they've decided to package Chromium as a snap only in future versions of Ubuntu. My first thought is, why isn't anybody using Firefox anyways? And who cares? Um, but it was interesting to note that um, Ubuntu did do good communication on this change. They went to their forums, like Michael said, they should be doing their official channels to mention that this issue was going to happen in the future. So that was a welcome change. Um, they stated today, Chromium updates are built and published for every supported Ubuntu release, except Trusty. Shortly after that, they're made available upstream. That's both time and resource consuming, and it's also not trivial to keep building it on older Ubuntu releases. So there seems to be some frustration over this due to the fact that other distros are still supporting Chromium. At least that's some of the arguments I said. Why are they saying it's difficult? Other distros are doing it. So they're kind of recycling the argument that was legitimate for 32 libs, but for this one Chromium snap package, I, I did try to say, well, why are people mad about this? Try to find some reasoning here. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not in rage over this. I'm not sure I care. But there was there is something interesting I do notice about a lot of these changes that Canonical makes, which is the same, you know, ex I don't want to say excuse is not excuse, but the same reason every time is resources, right? That they're going to change it because of resources, because resources. In this case, I guess it just kind of makes sense to me. But is this a situation where, you know, the snaps are going to become this huge thing? Canonical can continue to make this excuse for every piece of software, frankly, on their system. Well, it's too hard to maintain. We're going to put it in the snap. It's too hard to maintain and put it in the snap. Well, and is this going to affect other distros downstream? That's, and 
That's the only thing I could come up with. Of I, a valid I mean, are they not? Are they not just saying out loud what it has been reality for a long time? Exactly. It, like package maintaining is just a joke on Linux and has been for a very long time, and Snaps fix that. And so, yeah, do they sound like a broken record? Yes. Are they wrong? Absolutely not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing about that too. It, I agree that it is definitely a problem that they're trying to fix. And but they also said extra stuff. It's not just a maintenance of having this extra work. They there was also a, descri a description of the Chromium package has been updating certain things that were like security features in Chromium, but also feature adding and stuff like that that is not compatible with older versions of Ubuntu. And while as the Snap support is compatible. So the the fourteen oh four version had to they had to remove uh, Chromium from their dev package in fourteen oh four be you know older after after the fact of course but like because sixteen it was like in two thousand eighteen I think when they did it but they still had to do support for fourteen oh four but they were thinking like they they can't do have have the maintenance of the fourteen oh four version the sixteen oh four version the eighteen oh four version every other version that comes after that as well plus the snap it actually is. People would say it's it's just one application, but the amount of versions of Ubuntu that they have to support, and the amount of different interim versions that are supporting while they're creating them, and also having a snap that is it's one application yet, but it's like five or six packages that they're having to maintain. So doing the snap makes sense because the stuff that they had to remove in order to be compatible with the the rest of the infrastructure of the devs don't have to be removed as a snap. So they can have they could either fork Chromium, which would be a monstrous task, or they could just use a snap feature and have all the different added all the benefits and all the features that is Chromium's adding while they're adding it, rather than having to worry about whether they can support these individual features. Or you know, they said that if they have to remove certain features in order to make the devs work for the fourteen oh four, and then eventually the sixteen oh four, and then eighteen oh four is going to happen again. So the, making this decision is just for to future proof the ability to have Chromium without having to worry about losing support for these different features so that are coming. It's just because they have so many different versions. And to the argument people make, well, other distros in this case are supporting it, I would say, well, Arch and those other distros only have one, one. version yeah. to support. So it's it's a little easier for them in, in some cases. But um, I, I think what Noah said is dead on. If you, unless you have blinders on, this is what, this is where Canonical's going. They've put all, a lot of their eggs in the Snap basket. They spend a lot of time working with the community on building Snaps, on packaging things to Snaps. I think you're going to see tons of the software they maintain become Snaps in the future. And that's where they're pushing towards. And if you, you know, I, I just think that's going to be the future regardless. Yeah, and also uh, Darkwood in the in the patron chat also made a good point that the people forget that the Chromium and Chrome updates are happening every six weeks. So it's six packages for multiple different distros with multiple sets of, of core packages and have yep. to do that over and over every six weeks. And they also have to do the same thing for the Firefox because Firefox does every six weeks as well. So, I was going to say, surely that will be the next move then because it's the same sort of... But, but no, because Firefox doesn't do... The difference where Firefox doesn't work as kookily as... Chromium does is it is it purely a Chromium problem and not a browser problem and the speed at which browsers update? This is an this current issue is an individually a Chromium problem because of what the, mm. what the Chromium because the, Chromium doesn't necessarily abide by standards even though they're called standards and all browser developers and manufacturers are cre are agreed that these standards Chromium doesn't really implement them in a standard form and that's why there's a lot of times where people would say well Chromium works better it's because well it's a Google thing that Google also made Chromium, and therefore they bypass certain standards in order to make themselves look better, and mm -hmm. you know that kind of thing happens. So in, term, in the terms of Firefox, also cares about Linux support, so they don't ship the Linux support because well, they technically do with the tarball, but the Ubuntu does the packaging for Firefox, but they do pay attention to Linux support, so they actually are less likely to do something like that because mm -hmm. of like the open aspect of what they care about. So right now it you could in the future maybe Firefox could do something that requires a snap, but at the moment they don't really have they don't haven't done anything so far. So there's no reason for it, but I mean Chromium definitely has in multiple cases added features that are incompatible with various different aspects of the system. So overall I think that this is a, a good thing that they're doing and I also would argue that Debian, the dev files are not being replaced by snaps because people would take the advantage of like, you know, bashing Canonical for making this snap thing. And then like, 
any argue any time they have the chance to call them the devil, they will. Uh, but they there's it's it's ridiculous to say that snaps are hurting Debs because Debs are more of a core fundamentally well, functional. Well, aren't thing. snaps built from Debs? Pa- like, some of them they... can be yes. They well, also not all of them they don't are. require that anymore. They don't. Okay. They 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 it's it's the snaps are. Uh, their own separate thing, but they also have the support to be able to convert a deb and I'm pretty sure an RPM into snaps. Um, I see. But they have, uh, the main thing is that snaps are more useful as far as applications go. And I think that, you know, they, they don't have any intention. They've even said this multiple times that they have no intention of replacing devs overall in the core system. They still have this, you know, s- synergy with uh, Debian that they want to keep. And they just want to do like applications on as a snap because that's the biggest issue that we have as far as application distribution. In if like I've actually worked on a software as far as distributing applications in the Linux world, and the different packages for the different versions of it, of, all, of all these different distros is the most painful thing about making software for Linux. Like I can make one piece of software for the source code, but then I have to make 20 packages for the same distro because of like the different ver- well actually it's not as bad with the 32 bit versus 64 bit at least that half is gone but it used to be where you have to do 64 bit and 32 bit and that but it, depending on what distro it is they still have 32 bit so you still have to deal with that in so some cases so it just creates this huge issue where you could go you could be making one piece of software and you make one release then you have to make packages for like 30 to 40 different versions or you have a snap or even a flat pack or an app image or an app whatever. Image. Yeah, like, like that's so much better than like even if you people don't like snaps, you still have to acknowledge that they it's a it's a better solution than the thing we had previously. The traditional format was right. good for when it was created. It's not well, good now. No, it wasn't. Let me, it was no, good, it, was it was good compared to what we had at the time. You know, it was basically I mean, nothing. It's better for building from source by if the, by that you mean it's better. Yeah, that's I what agree. I meant. It was better for okay. what it was purposely <laughs> built for, but now definitely. So let let me throw in a, a different thought here. OMG Ubuntu had an article talking about snaps, and they were reporting in there that the Skype snap, because we all know how much Microsoft loves mm-hmm. Linux, uh, <laughs> has not been updated for six months. Mm-hmm. So Microsoft it's not Canonical's had, fault. Had originally no, I'm not saying it is. Uh, Microsoft originally stated the Snap version would allow them to keep Skype up to date across all devices, but here it is sitting unmaintained, but the RPM and Debian versions on the Skype website are fully updated. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is because if you recall a week or two ago, we talked about fragmentation between, is this adding additional fragmentation? In? And it seems like whoever's supporting Microsoft's Skype version in the Snap is not keeping it up to date, at least according to this article, but yeah. somebody's keeping the dev and RPM versions up to date um, instead. So in essence, did it solve the fragmentation issue in this one case? And is this something we're going to see from a lot of vendors who move to a snap and then maybe decide, oh, we're just going to do the dev and RPM anyways, and you've got a snap sitting out there unsupported? I mean, I don't even know what Microsoft, Microsoft specifically said they're going to be switching to snaps. Like they were switching completely. And that we we have no choice, and then there's now updating the devs and the RPMs and the not de- updating this. I don't, who knows? I don't know what. They're doing. <laughs> it's just well, it's, it's Microsoft, right? It, they say <laughs> they're going to do one thing, and they don't do that. They don't do it, and they they say they love Linux, and you know they they say that they're list they're Linux distro developers, even though they don't do that. They just make a you know garbage inside of their own Windows thing. You know, whatever they say things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. So it's official. Uh, Red Hat and IBM have merged, and Noah is completely distraught over this. Uh, so he th- upset. He, he thinks this is just an awful thing. Uh, but anyway, I- IBM has uh, purchased a Red Hat for thirty-four billion dollars, and that's basically paying one hundred ninety-four dollars per share for Red Hat. Uh, this is IBM's largest deal ever, and it's for an open-source company, which is fantastic. And the official press release had this to say, joining forces with IBM gives Red Hat the opportunity to bring more open source innovation to even broader range of organizations and will enable us to scale to meet the need for hybrid cloud solutions that deliver true choice and agility. This was the CEO of Red Hat, uh, Jim Whitehurst. And this is this is interesting because there's a lot of people who are still uh, bothered by this happening. And uh, what Noah said on the Ask Noah show recently was interesting because about the whole, the cultural, the culture of the company for Red Hat is 
why you want to purchase them. Because if you want to, like when you said that when I, if you want to change a company, a big company like IBM, you need people who have the mindset that you want them to have. So getting Red Hat to do that is the best option. Yeah, if you, if, if you want more people, if you want more companies like Red Hat and less companies like IBM, then you want to get people from companies like Red Hat to work in companies like IBM. That makes perfect sense, right? But the, you know, the other thing is like, I, I look at this and I'm like, man, the things that they're going to be able to accomplish and mm -hmm. how great the world's going to be when they promote Jim Whitehurst to CEO. Oops, did I say that out loud? <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, but really though, I mean, why else you look at IBM, you look at their strategy, buy a company, doesn't work out, buy something, doesn't work out. The only thing IBM is successful in, in the only thing that IBM is successful in is massive, massive, massive B2B uh, style business, right? They're custom designing architecture, infrastructure, stuff like that. Um, that's where IBM makes their money today. If you're IBM and you have a fat checkbook and you're like, listen, we want to rise to dominance again. We want to be a dominant company. How do we do that? I know. Let's find a company that's already succeeding and buy them and let them do what they do. And then our name is behind it. And so we're attached and get to ride that gravy train up. So it makes everybody so worried about them coming in and, and you know, peeing on Red Hat's Cheerios. It doesn't make any sense. That's not going to happen. And I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I really, for the life of me, nobody, and I do mean nobody, can give me a solid argument of why IBM would spend $34 billion to buy a company which has no intellectual property just to turn them into IBMers. Doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. It has to work out as a positive thing. It's going to work out as a positive thing. Yeah, and well, IBM has also contributed to the Linux ecosystem for a long time. So it's not like sure. just, they just brand. They just uh, not quite to the extent up. Red Hat has. Though, well, right? I'm, I'm mean, just saying like, they, they have, they've, they're not like one of those open wash companies where they're just, oh, hey, it's good to be a part of Linux. It's good to be a part of open source. Like, we <coughs> or, love Linux. You know, Oracle, Microsoft, Cisco, mm -hmm. companies like that that are now all on the side of openness. IBM has been a part of it for a long time. They even made like a Super Bowl commercial for Linux back in the day. It was a very bad commercial, but at least they did it. Hey, I remember, you, you know, um, most of the, C, the the mergers I remember are terrible acquisitions that do end up destroying companies. And so, Noah, I agree with you there. Your argument of why this one should be and likely will be different is valid. But I also understand why so many people, especially if you've ever been a part of companies merging, have this fear that this will be another merger where they're just going to go in there, spend a bunch of money, buy it, lay off all the employees, you know, turn the product to crap. And that's what we're left with. In this case, though, like you said, there is no other product other than really the people and culture there that is being sold. So it does make it different. But I do understand why people are scared of it because anytime you have these big companies coming in, uh, they tend to run over a lot of things. Uh, as Michael put it, giants that step on stuff uh, a lot. But in this case, it is good to see that the current CEO of Red Hat is going to remain on board with the new company, which to me is a positive sign in a merger because they're not. And a lot of times during these mergers, what they do is they get rid of the old executives for the most part, get them out mm -hmm. the door, give them a nice pretty parachute and want them gone because they want to make all the decisions. But in this case, they're keeping Red Hat CEO on board, which means yep. he's still going to be a part of making decisions, still being a part of making um, uh, the culture that has been so successful for Red Hat there. So ultimately, I wish the best for all of them, and I hope this turns I, out to be. A I, yeah, time. I I think there's more of a risk of IBM IBMers feeling like they got invaded than there is of. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, oh, because so here's the thing. I have a good. I have a couple of friends that they they used to work for Red Hat. Or they used to work for IBM. They left IBM and came to Red Hat to get away from IBM because they couldn't stand the culture and they couldn't stand the business mentality. They couldn't stand the practice and all that. So you can imagine how they reacted when <laughs> uh, when when this news broke, right? I mean, mm -hmm. massive, massive, massive strings of profanity that you know span for hours, right? And so, and I'm trying to talk to these people off the ledge. I'm like, listen, think about it. Like, and and I think Ryan and I probably have the best insight. Uh, into something like this because both him and I have been around small business. And when you're in small business, whether you know it or not, you naturally start to gravitate towards what's in the best interest of the clients. And so when you start to think about, when you start to think about it from that perspective, look at what IBM and Red Hat do, what, what they stand to do very, very well is serve their clients. Well, both of those companies solve problems. And so when you put the massive paycheck of IBM behind the massive uh, open source work of Red Hat, how do you not wind up with success? And I'll tell you what, if 
if I'm wrong about this, if I'm wrong and uh, and IBM in, in Red Hat isn't the most successful acquisition IBM has ever made, and if it doesn't make IBM a ton of money, and if in, in a few years Red Hat doesn't become the most dominant open source company in the world... No, I'll we'll have, pay off my mortgage. No, but I will have to rethink this whole open source thing. I mean, for real. <laughs> it, it, there's, there's, this has, there is no excuse to fail here, right? If what we believe is accurate about open source in that... Hey, we think it's a better way to do business. We think it's there's a there's a profit to be made. We believe that Linux users are willing to pay for for the kind of support that they need to run uh, in in mission critical applications. If all of that stuff is actually true, then this should be a gold mine for IBM. And if it's not, we're wrong about something. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought you were going to say you know that the people the phrase I'll eat my hat. I think you're going to say I'll eat my red hat. I'll eat my red hat if they don't. <laughs> no, I'm just going to switch to Windows. Oh, that'll that'll that's, work yeah. out fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that is, I'll just get a spare not. iPhone from Ryan and I'll switch over to iOS. Fourteenth <laughs> of July, twenty nineteen. Noted. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> uh, but also, I do think it's funny. To, it's also worth noting that the, uh, the the they did announce like the uh, CEO of uh, IBM has, and also some uh, the senior vice president of IBM also. Jenny Romney. Yeah. Yeah. They, they they also responded to the questions about what's going to happen to Red Hat. And they, they did it specifically because now that it's official, they can answer specifically. And they said, basically, nothing is changing. The headquarters are going to mm -hmm. stay the same. The, the, all the people who work for Red Hat are staying. Like, all that stuff. And, like, they're not changing really anything. And they even said that there's basically no competition between Red Hat and IBM except for one service that they offer. And they said that both of the services are going to stay around because people, various different companies depend on various different software. So they're not going to even merge that together. They're still going to keep all the stuff separate. So I think that, you know, as far as like, uh, essentially just, it seems like they're just giving more funding to Red Hat rather than. That's they, right. Yeah. They, they're, they want to. And they sold Lotus, right? So, I mean, there's, yeah. there's that. So, mm. no, let me ask you, do you foresee that we're going to get, the some impacts from this in a big way we know we'll have some but in a big way on the desktop side of linux or is this just going to be pure cloud no i think i i, I don't I mean, as much as I would like to say, I yeah, I'm sure desktop is going to become a huge focus for them now. No, I don't think so at all. I, I think, honestly, somewhat of the opposite is going to happen, to be honest with you. I think that what you're going to see is a mass, what the, the buzzword bingo that, that, that keeps going around. And I interviewed probably on the order of 12 to 15 Red Hat employees uh, at, 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 over, over the past few weeks uh, or a few months, I guess. And um, and and the thing that I keep hearing is is hybrid hybrid cloud right? They they want to mix on prem stuff with cloud because there are certain things that make sense to do uh, on prem because it's faster and they they can do things. But then they also want the benefit of the cloud. And so IBM, I think that's what they saw the value in Red Hat, and I think that's what they're interested in funding. And so. If you talk to any Red Hat people and you talk to any of the executives, obviously, like I say, it's it sounds like buzzword bingo and they all want to use these fancy terms. But the basic premise is they want to to to, to put it into to simple terms, uh, they want Cody MD, but they want Cody MD that can sync with the DigitalOcean instance of Cody MD. They want both Dang. sides of that, right? They they want the ability to have it run on prem and they want the ability to go back it, it, to to take to leverage the cloud as well. And so if that's what IBM's interested in, and frankly, that's where all of the money is. I mean, I would love I, I would lo love nothing more for Red Hat to be a company that all they care about is open source and desktop, right? But at the end of the day, the reason that IBM or that Red Hat is worth $34 billion is because they know how to play the game. And the reason, mm -hmm. frankly, that Canonical is not worth $34 billion is because they're too concentrated on things that don't make them any money. They're so concerned about getting, uh, about saying, hey, we'll go ahead and give a bunch away for free and everybody can run it on a VPS. And guess what? More VPS is run Ubuntu than any other operating system known to man, but they don't make any money off of each one of those. So if from an open source perspective, it's really fun inside of community circles to go, isn't it great that Ubuntu is this you know, prolific operating system that's everywhere, but in in practical terms and an ability to, and I think this is the important part, ability to give back to the community, ability to fix GNOME, for example, when something breaks and you say, hey, we have this desktop thing that is broken, uh, you know, what do you do? I, the, the, the total number of GNOME employees would blow your mind at Red Hat alone. And that's, that is totally aside from all of the community stuff, right? What's the total, the, the total, the total size of, and I don't know exactly what Canonical is up to, but the, the last numbers that I got, 
the total number of gnome employees alone that work at Red Hat is like something like 10 times the amount of employees that Canonical has as an entire company. So at least, you know, they're, their, their main office. So I, I'm sure they've got remote people and stuff like that that contribute. But, uh, but yeah, I, it's, it's, it's staggering the impact that it's going to, that, that Red Hat is going to have. So in that way, I think there's going to be some improvement on the desktop. But do I think IBM has any interest whatsoever in any, any way to improve the desktop? Probably not. Is their money going to get pushed towards uh, desktop use because it's important to Red Hat? Yes. And that's why I like Red Hat because they do those things. So what yeah. you're saying is that IBM is going to make GNOME multi-threaded. Nice. No, Thanks, well, Noah. kind of. I, what I'm saying is, <laughs> IBM is going to dump hundreds of, of millions of dollars into uh, in, into this into this uh, infrastructure building this thing. It's going to make Red Hat a very profitable company. The GNOME team might quadruple in size, and then they will fix the GNOME multi-threaded problem. So, yeah, I guess in an indirect way, that is what I was saying. I find it interesting <laughs> though that a lot of the, you you talk about you know Linux making money with the companies, and obviously the one example we have of the company making the most is Red Hat has to be server, has to be focused on cloud, and, and, and why would they focus on desktop when two of the biggest companies literally in existence in tech made their money off the desktop first. So yeah. I think Canonical's move is interesting in that they did focus on the desktop mm -hmm. uh, so heavily to make their entry into you know uh, getting their name out there and becoming well, popular and are now moving towards that cloud base as a result. Now, you could argue it's too slow or they're making missteps along the way or whatever, and that, that may be true, but I think ignoring the desktop would be a fatal error. I, 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 I submit to you that before Canonical's Ubuntu became a desktop environment, Linux had under, you know, you know, under 3%. After Canonical's 10-year run, or well, I guess been more than that now, but after Canonical's, however long they've been trying to make Linux for human beings run, we're now at almost, what, 7%, maybe maybe 6%. I mean, we just haven't moved the needle very far, right? That's doubling. Right. What are you talking about? Yeah, great. So if we just do that another 10 times, we'll uh, we'll, we'll finally get somewhere. I, I mean, it just hasn't worked. I mean, I, I, and again, you're talking to the guy that literally does not own a computer that has any other desktop uh, operating system installed other than uh, other than uh, Linux, except for the computer that Michael loaned me, which has Windows. <laughs> of course, that's not true. Not true. No, but I, I don't have any computers. That, like I would love nothing more than for Linux to be dominant on the desktop. But at the end of the day, home users are cheap. Desktop users are cheap, and a lot of and whether we like it or not, we get a we get a disproportionate amount of people that come to Linux because they want a budget friendly operating system and something that works a little bit better than Windows. They're just not willing sometimes to pay for stuff. Now, Ryan, you and I, I'm sure if tomorrow. Red Hat came out and they said, we have what we're going to call enterprise desktop Linux that is specifically designed for the desktop. It has all of the codecs you need for audio. It has like all of the stuff that is pain is a pain. We have these hardware vendors that it's going to come pre-installed. The only catch is it's 1500 bucks. You and I'd buy a license for that in a heartbeat. Yeah. Absolutely. I would. Uh, but it's, I just don't think that's most people. Yeah. Um, that's a good, I, I, it's an interesting point. I also think that it's, it's the, the, the fact that you're talking about like how, like you gave, Ryan gave an example of the two biggest companies with, uh, our desktop, you know, especially like the biggest company being Apple having the uh, Apple's not, no, that's not Apple still has, Apple has less than 10%. No, no, I'm talking about money wise. He's talking about size of the companies, yeah. meaning they're, they're but they don't, but, but that's not, that's not a fair compare. That's not a fair comparison. Dollars. No, no, that's that, not yeah. a point. My point is that the, what the, the way that Apple makes money is by selling the most expensive things they can. The way that Microsoft made money is being cutthroat and making sure that as many companies that compete with them die or they buy it, buy them out. So okay. the way that it's interesting because both of your points kind of connect to each other in the sense that uh, Ubuntu is in a situation where they have the dominance of, of desktop on or even just dominance in general in Linux, but they did it for free because they're not cutthroat and they're right. not focused on making the most right. money in the server. But that also means that they still have the dominance, but they didn't make any benefit for themselves of getting that dominance. They like well, not only not only did they not make any benefit of themselves, they fundamentally handicapped their ability to influence the market. Right? Like if the they they don't have any money to spend on the like they want to they want to go public and they can't because they need to make their company more profitable. Like that's the battle that they're struggling in. Well, Red Hat's looking around, going, "What are we going to do with all this money?" 
<laughs> like, what can we fund? Hey, hey, you over there with the free IPA project? Hey, that's a great job. You started that free IPA Active Directory service for Linux? That's really cool. We like that. Hey, you know what? Come work for us. We'll give you $200,000 a year, and, and we'll just uh, we'll just go ahead and absorb that project. Well, do you own my project? No, no, no. no. It's all open source. We'll just leave it. Just Here, just take $200,000 a year. We'll just give you money. Just uh, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing good work, man. Doing good work. That's what they do. They go and they find these community projects, and they just throw massive amounts of money at it, and say, let's get this up and then we'll go ahead and package that up. Yeah, we're going to sell it as part of our enterprise package. I, ju- I have to ask the question, what has a bigger impact on the on the greater open source community, Red Hat or Canonical? I mean, it's it's interesting because like Ubuntu has the, does the same kind of thing, but they're not doing it at the same scale. So like, right. like which matters. Yeah. Right. I mean, it doesn't matter. But in the sense of like, you know, you're bringing in someone who who's bringing who's improving stuff at in a, in a, in like like your example of the free IPA. Uh, Ubuntu has done that, too, where they they the synaptic developer and the app developer is now a canonical mm-hmm. employee. And he is, you know, pr- helping Debian and helping, you know, canonical and all this other stuff like they they, they are doing that. To put a, a an exact example on what you're talking about, I would guess that that guy probably has maybe an office, a laptop. Maybe he's got a couple of people working for him, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, free IPA, to put that into perspective for you, has an entire department. A, not only a department, but an entire support department on top of the department to handle uh, identity management. Like, if you if you have an issue at Red Hat and you say, I have an issue with my Red Hat thing and I need some identity management stuff, like, there's an entire support system uh, right. it, it, that uh, part department that is built around uh, the free IPA and, and identity management. I mean, that's, I mean, that's big, that's huge. And mm. so as a customer and as somebody who wants to sit down, you're like, Hey, you know what? I'd really like to have to be able to sit down at any of my Linux boxes, type in one username, one password, all my files show up, all my applications show up, all my directories get mapped. All my stuff is there. That is possible because of some guy who did great work and at Red Hat just looked over and went, Hey, you do that here and we'll give you money. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Speaking of yeah. which, Red Hat and IBM, I'm working on this new project. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you joke, but uh, you, literally, if you if you can get some traction behind it and, and and actually do a really good job and and get it going and release on time, uh, they'll they'll absolutely okay, look done. over and say <laughs> release on time. I'm done. <laughs> I think it's interesting because there there's some there's something there where you know Red Hat and what I and what IBM can do together could create some incredible synergies. And I actually hope that they do execute on what I think is a, the reason why Linux only has 7%. This is coming from a user who made his living off of Windows, still makes his living off of Windows and uh, switched to Linux, not because I had to, but because I just found it better that we have no marketing push for the desktop. Yeah, that's the biggest problem. We have lame ducks mm-hmm. who are representing Linux on the desktop. And I, I just hate to say it, but that's how I feel. When you have all these hardware manufacturers yep. out there and all this stuff being pushed into Linux where there's suddenly interest in, the only thing we're executing on is, well, we had a partner with this company before, so we'll just keep partnering yep. with them and ignore all these other companies. Yep. It's a lame duck scenario. Yeah. That's yeah. On when's the, the last desktop. time? When's the, why can't you walk into Best Buy and purchase a Linux computer? Yeah. Why is there no why is there no Apple Bar equivalent of why is there no little Tux bar inside of a Best Buy? You know why? Because there's no company that has the budget to do something like that. Mm-hmm. And Red Hat probably is one of the only companies that are capable of doing such a thing, right? It it is it's not it is not inconceivable by any stretch of the imagination that IBM and or, IBM slash Red Hat. I guess I mean, that's going to be weird to start saying. We'll just say purple IBM hat. IBM hat. IBM hat will look over and go, "Hey, you're making hardware. That's a cool company. Maybe they just buy Lenovo back. <laughs> How great would that be, <laughs> right? But like, you know, it's not un- inconceivable that they look over, find a hardware company, and go, "Hey, you, you're us now." Congratulations. So I just hope IBM brings back the blue lightning line of processors because that would make my day as my first processor I ever owned. And back in the day, IBM processors rocked. There was a point where Intel dominated them, but until that point, they were amazing CPUs out there. But I, I agree. Is it is this a situation? Let me just throw this out there where you know we see WSL, we see a lot of work with Canonical and Microsoft where they're gonna kind of try to hone that partnership while IBM and Red Hat hone their partnership. Well, no, Red Hat also has a partnership with Microsoft. Okay, they both do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, interesting. I think this type of news is going to keep coming around, and it's just a simple case of watch this space. See yeah, who's it's right. interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. 
So I think I think there's a ton of potential that could be good. I mean, I, I think that if it was if it was another company that had purchased Red Hat, I'd be more scared than it's but but IBM does not scare me in the sense of them them trying to ruin stuff because they've been trying to be good stewards of the community for a long time anyway. It just this allows them to be one of the best, if not the best stewards of the of the community if they do it the right way. So now let's move on to the gaming section. And this is with the new Ryan, this is fast becoming my favorite section of the show. Um, yeah. So what we're going to talk about, talk about this week is Valve rolls out Steam Labs. So Valve has been busy rolling out a lot of competitive services, like ramping up for the competition from Stadia, Sony, and Microsoft, who've been knocking on their front door. So this week, Valve announced Steam Labs. This allows the community to be involved in dozens of experiments like video, machine learning, discoverability, and more that Steam works on behind the scenes. So they brought this out with three experiments that you can test out at the moment. We've got micro trailers. It's a mini six second trailer for games. You've got the interactive recommender, which uses prediction services to recommend you games that you might like. And then we've got the automatic show, which is an automated 30 minute show about Steam games. Now, this opens up the community approach in, in a great way to get more direct feedback and testers on new products and ideas that were not only open to a select few before. One thing is for sure, Valve is not taking this competition from the likes of Stadia and Sony and Microsoft sitting down. But where this scores for me is next week, I'll get a game that Ryan says, can you review this, please? I can go to a micro trailer and only waste six seconds of my time <laughs> on that game. I haven't got to sit there for two and a half minutes. Oh, I don't like this idea anymore. How am I going to waste your well, to, be, to be fair, the micro trailers are actually kind of more like uh, thumb, movable thumbnails. Like they don't really open up new videos and they don't have like audio that I could tell. No, uh, but they're great because I actually picked up on one that talks about I think it was called Delivery Driver. So I've got to go and find this because this is going to be another opportunity for me to drive around town like a lunatic whilst <laughs> attempting to deliver parcels. So, and I and I I much I much preferred it to their standard offering of searching for a game, finding it, and then going watching two or three sure. video. Sure, you can actually sit there for. You don't have to do 30 minutes. You can skip your way through until you find a section that you're interested in. And all of a sudden, it's like, bash, bash, bash. You've now got an idea of 15 games within 30 seconds that you've watched. And for me, who isn't really a gamer but, but wants to pick specific types of games, I think this is going to be a great feature. Yeah. I, really I, just like, I just like seeing Valve understand the competitive scenario that they're in now because mm -hmm. basically... It, it was interesting a couple of years ago before that the new Xbox and new PlayStation 4 were released, Xbox was going to go to a model that Stadia is doing where they basically were going to stream games and the community freaked out and screamed at the top of their lungs. Do you don't, you dare do this. We'll all just get Sony and Sony came out and said, we're not going to do that. We're going to give you the hard disk, the game. And Microsoft had to go back to the factory and tell them, okay, actually you're going to have to put in, uh, a disk drive into our system so that people can play these games because we're about to lose the market. But now you're at a situation where, as far as I understand it, you've got Stadia coming out, you have Sony and Microsoft coming out with competitive streaming services as well, and Valve is now has some competition, which ultimately is going to probably be great for us as consumers. But I'm happy they're not just sitting there like, well, we became kings and now we'll just relax. Now they're looking at right. ways that they can bring the community into their services more. They're going to throw a bunch. Yep. To me, this looks like these three ones they launched for are interesting, but my guess is they're going to be throwing lots of things like this out here, mm -hmm. just like spaghetti on a wall saying, hey, go out here, test this. Do you like this idea? Yeah. Do you hate it? Do you want us to change it? And be able to make rapid changes utilizing the community to be able to decide which one should stay and which one should go. Yeah. And, and do, I think do you think, Ryan, that this is also where they're going to sort of like launch stuff like they've recently done where they've said, like, hey, AMD users, come and test this new 
renderer come and test this new this is where you're going to pick that information up and you're not going to be, have to be the ultimate geek and reading the forums or reading foreignx or any of the other really good linux sites around to get this information you can open up your steam window go to steam labs and go oh i can do that and i can take part and it's yeah. opening up to millions of more users I want to I want to say a special thank you by the way to our community what not only supporting Noah's project um out there but also when I put out there about AMD and or Valve asking for testers I received so much feedback uh privately and even publicly about hey I'm going to help out hey I have AMD I've downloaded this so many people jumping in to help that's what makes open source beautiful um in in this case it's what makes communities beautiful period we have one of the best communities i think out there if you go to our telegram group you could see it within 5 seconds mm -hmm. um i think somebody commented uh yesterday zeb that they couldn't believe that they had talked to the host within their first all the hosts of the show within their first 15 yep. seconds of joining the telegram group <laughs> and um, literally all he all he had done is he wanted to come on find out the name of the show where we did the wendy hill photography interview but instantly got hooked by the community who engaged with him within seconds gave him the name of the show that he wanted he then asked on some follow on questions and boom he was hooked like right. the, the threat to burn down his house that didn't even play into it well <laughs> we don't mention that part oh <laughs> no but i we do have a great community but i love that valve is reaching out to their community to yeah. um to get assistance in helping and listen they've done so much for linux and and the gaming standpoint and brought so many new users that would never have existed before and attention to linux that um I think they deserve a lot of support. Yeah, there are a mm -hmm. lot of people who who told me that the only reason they switch is because Valve made it possible for them to switch because they could play certain games that they wanted to play, yep. and that's awesome. Because I mean, Valve is a is a a game changer, uh, pun intended, uh, that is a, in various different ways, <laughs> and I think that these these streamlabs are going to be so much. Uh, so much better for like the community because we're able to like the worst thing about Valve, which is not even that bad of a thing, is that they kind of held their cards close to their to their chest, and, and so you'd only know as soon as they're ready to announce it. And like for example, with the Proton thing, no one yeah. knew that they were even doing that until they announced it. If they were told us that they were making Proton, we would have promoted that way like so high. And there would be because when it came out, it was as good as we wanted it to be. And it just keeps getting better and better. So this way, it allows them to give us new things that they're working on and let us, as a community, test it. And uh, even the interactive recommender thing that they that they announced for this, like one of the first three, uh, I think that one has a ton of potential. As, as, a, as a Linux user, there's still a little bit more because I it's killing me some Windows games that I don't want to play and don't work on Proton. But uh, those, like, I mean, I do want to play the games, but they, I can't. Uh, but those uh, like the 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 recommender has so much more potential. I think that uh, a lot of people wouldn't give it credit for because like the recommend the the current system of the recommendations are not very good. And yeah, the, the only thing filters, about the recommender is it has no Linux option to right. select as one of your Correct. filters yeah. that they need to yeah. add that in. Yeah, the search they all, the only I would be super happy with the current situation if the recommender and the search filters. Added the ability to. We already have the Steam, the Linux for or, or Steam OS for the search filter, but adding a Proton filter as well, mm. and that mm -hmm. would be fantastic. Because like, yeah. there, there, I recently found out there's an extension for Firefox. Speaking of Firefox being great, uh, there's an extension for Firefox where you can go to the store page, and it will tell you on the sections of like you know the top right top se section of like the details of the game, of what it's rating on for the Proton DB. A rating is so that's really cool because it'll like you can quickly see it without having to go to proton db and search for it and that thing nice so, so that's a really cool thing I, i'm pretty sure it's just proton db for firefox or whatever uh but that's awesome and i would i would prefer steam to build that into their actual site but you know it's awesome that that there's they're doing the things that they're doing now because anytime they're doing something it's usually to benefit the gaming community unlike epic who sucks <laughs> Speaking of Valve, Valve has continued to do amazing things, as we mentioned, for Linux gaming, and this includes making every new title that they release available on day one for Linux. And one of Valve's latest games, Dota Underlords, is an early access game that is available right now, and of course, it plays directly on Linux because that's what Valve does. In this game, you hire a crew, destroy your rivals. It's a strategy battler set in the world of Dota, 
Uh, you join the beta season with crossplay, and you can play this on your mobile device and then switch to your desktop version of the game. And the graphics are incredible. I can't believe they have graphics like this on the mobile device uh, that they can get. You know, the desktop makes sense, but it's beautiful on mobile as well because I've been playing it and it's a lot of fun. Um, so Valve is making the Honey Pot even fuller by providing now free access to their prototype battle passes so that people can test, learn, and adapt, or they can test, learn, and adapt from feedback from the community uh, while they check test out things like the Battle Pass. For those not aware, Battle Pass is a concept used by really popular games like Fortnite and things. It's generally seen as a more welcome alternative to loot boxes, which you know are considered basically gambling, uh, whereas a Battle Pass uh, takes away a lot of that annoyance and shadiness that is in loot box systems. Um, but they're giving this free to people right now. So you can go just use the battle pass for free to test it out and tell them, hey, do you like it? Do you not? Do you think they went too far in one area or not another? Um, they're making visual improvements already. They've already released patches with UI changes, improved matchmaking, plenty of bug fixes. And unlike the other game they launched that I died in the tutorial, this one actually has 90,000 <laughs> active players uh, and they're very happy. There's tons of positive feedback on this game. It's getting lots of airtime on Twitch and other streaming services. So whether you like this genre of game or not, one thing is for certain out of this show that we know for sure without a doubt, and that is Valve actually does seem to love Linux. And mm -hmm. go check out and, Unlike game. you, they are playing their cards right. <laughs> That's right. This week's Software Spotlight was sent in from a listener. His name is Josh. Josh writes, I recently checked out a new piece of software and wanted to recommend it to the community. It is the Next Cloud Pie, and the website is ownyourbits.com slash nextcloudpie. NextCloud is a suite. Uh, well, we all know what NextCloud is. Uh, Next, Next Cloud Pie makes setting it up on a server on a Raspberry Pi very attainable to novices like myself. It uses a GUI to set it up and different configurations that I need, including but not limited to a cron job for IP changes, cert bot for certificate for secure certificates, and even a couple of free domain services, all for a computer that costs less than 100 bucks, including the external hard drive. Last year, I downloaded an uncloud server, and it took me almost a week to figure it all out. Using NextCloud, it took me about an hour. If you haven't checked it out, it might be good for a new Raspberry Pi or even an old one, since you might have an, uh, an extra one that's been replaced by the i4. Thanks for the excellent podcast. Ryan's the best. Josh. Oh, yeah, you're right. And I'm going to do that project with my Raspberry Pi 4. I think that's a fantastic project to have a local NextCloud instance on a very low cost little device like this. So I love this idea, Josh, and I am going to put that. In fact, I have it loaded on the micro SD card right here on my RASP 4 to test this out because it's such a low powered option. And within this tool that they have pre-set up for you, because you could do all this manually, but this is just kind of an easy GUI interface to get all of this set up. You could uh, walk through step-by-step -step, uh, external storage on the device as well. So you can, and, and again, you could do that manually, but again, you just click a box in the GUI and it's done for you. You can plug in additional external drives and have a little localized NextCloud server set up on a Raspberry Pi 4. So I will let you all know how it works or whether it burns down my house because the thing heats up too much or not. But that's what I'll be doing with the RASP 4 and we'll do it on video on my channel coming up. Excellent. You have the power. No, wait, you don't. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. Because I'm waiting for that USB-C cable to come. Okay. This week's tip and trick is a really interesting application for mobile that I heard about originally on the Ask Noah show. And it was it's called Be My Eyes. And that it's it's a really cool idea, and it allows you for if you for people who are blind to use this application to get other people who are who are sighted to be able to help uh, with you know whatever random tasks that you wanted to get help with, and it also allows people who are you know who are sighted to volunteer to help people who have vision problems. And this when I, when I, when Noah talked about it, I was like, okay, we'll see. It's really cool. That's, unfortunately, I haven't after I was able to catch the call that was actually activated to me, but I went on and watched the uh, YouTube some YouTube examples of it, and it is a really awesome idea because there's like times where people would be like, I just can't read this individual thing, 
uh, you know, this is the right, I have these two different products, which one's which, and then just go on YouTube and or go on this app and they show, you know, this person just say, it just picks that one. So it's like a four or five second long uh, call to help this person out, which is just a fantastic concept. And I'm surprised it didn't already exist or I don't know how long this thing has existed, but I was surprised like this is like a, this is just a, such an awesome concept we had to feature it on the show as well. Yeah, it's, and the way they describe it is every day sighted volunteers lend their eyes to solve tasks big and small to help blind and low vision people lead more independent lives. It utilizes the camera both ways. So it's like, you know, you set up like a FaceTime or whatever uh, type of setup where you get to see through their camera and you see what they're seeing and you say, okay, well, that's what this label reads or like you said, helping. But I also thought, you know, this could even help from a software standpoint because we talked about accessibility and how a lot of it's missing in documentation. Sometimes it could be a simple app where you need to know what this, maybe the screen reader Orca or something like that is not reading it properly. Somebody who had a low vision or um, uh, or were blind needed to, to uh, know what said on the screen. Obviously, people aren't going to provide technical support, but need to know, is it next? Where do I click? Is What is the next screen going on? Someone could help them through that through computer tasks as well, because it's anything that they could call you about to help them uh, with the issue. So I just see so much potential for this. But the biggest thing is it brings communities together. Yeah. I mean, you've got people helping each other out randomly just because I think it's the worst idea possible for you to put that on your phone, Michael, because you'll never answer it. But for everyone else, it's a fantastic idea. <laughs> no, no, I'll answer it. But a week later. <laughs> a week later. <laughs> no, I, I, in this particular case, I would definitely be uh, at least a little bit prompt. A little, a bit. little bit. So, Noah, thank you for bringing this one to our attention. Yeah, I think it's cool. The thing is, you know what's interesting to me? They, they said they have about... Um, I think they said they have fifth, like 10 times or 15 times more volunteers than they have blind people. Like they launched this app and they're like, here's a free way to help some people. Gee, I hope we can get enough volunteers. And then all of a sudden people are like, I'll help. We'll all help the whole world. Like it, like it restores your faith in humanity. You're like, oh, wow, there are amazing people in the world. Yeah. And it's such a great use of technology. And it's so simple to help somebody because it's, it's yeah. a you know, small time commitment and it's a big help that you could provide someone through it. So it's just awesome all the way around. Great idea, yeah. great implementation. And it takes two minutes to install because I've just done it now on my phone. Beautiful. <laughs> nice. So a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening to Destination Linux. We love our patrons and... Coffee supporters, you're welcome, Noah. Just want to give a special shout out for all of your support. We do a live show for our patrons, so come and join us if you want to be a part of the show. You can join for just one single dollar, and that's darn near free. That's right. We're also on Kofi as a way to support the show. Kofi offers a nice monthly option that you that allows you to have the same perks as our Patreon. So there'll be a link in the show notes and on the website on how to become a patron of Kofi. The perks include things like live access to the unedited versions of the show, as well as our most sincere gratitude. Wait a minute. I pronounced it right, and now you switch? This is ridiculous. Did he switch? He did. Oh, oh, we did. I, I couldn't even know this. Did couldn't everybody tell. caught that I said Kofi? Did y'all catch that I said patron of Kofi? Mm -hmm. Yep, okay, sure did. did. Made Zeb happy. The, the correct way of doing it, right? Oh, come on. Just when I finally <laughs> get it right, now you switch on me. No, again. I'm not going to switch. I just give it a hard That was awesome. Please get back to us. Let us know what you think. Or ask that burning question. Is it Kofi or is it Kofi? Let us know what you, our patrons, think. So you can get back to us via numerous methods. Email, comments at destinationlinux.org, our Telegram group, Discord, Twitter, Mastodon, and a whole host of other ways that Michael has let us know on the website, destinationlinux.org forward slash contact. So please keep the comments and questions coming. We love to read them and hear of ways we might be able to improve the show. And we love to hear about your use of Linux. And also, don't the content doesn't stop here. So if you want some more uh, content, then you can check out our own channels where you can go to uh, youtube.com slash dosgeek to check out Ryan where he fills your brains on hardware, software, and all things Linux. You can check out Zeb at youtube.com slash zebdiboss where you can find Zeb dr driving crazy speeds, moving aside caravans in his live streams. You can also find my content at tuxdigital.com where I do an in-depth weekly Linux Can News uh, podcast, This Week in Linux, and other Linux-related content. 
Uh, you can find Noah where he does a weekly talk radio show at, on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Central at the, at the asknoahshow.com where he can answer all your Linux and tech, tech questions, especially coffee questions. Uh, and also remember to... Coffee. Oh, my bad. Sorry. Kofi questions. And be sure to like that smash button and share the show on social media. So everybody have a great week. And remember that for AMD, the burning question read the destination is, are we there yet? That is not what I wrote. That is awesome. Great <laughs> job, Zeb. Great job, Zeb. You troll it all over the it place. It was supposed to be. Everybody would have a great week. Remember, AMD is superior to NVIDIA. That is what you're supposed to read. Now go back and do it again, Zeb. Take I two. I can't tell a lie. Take two. <laughs> okay, take two. Right, okay, right. Okay. Go. Everybody have a great week. And remember that for AMD, the burning question re NVIDIA is, are we superior? <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure if that's <laughs> good or what's, what's that? I mean, it's kind of better. I mean, it's kind of better. We... <laughs> you better go with the first one, though. It's, that's <laughs> perfect. perfect.